Hey everybody, my name is Asil Attar and you're listening to Anything is Possible. I'm Patrick Sang, global citizen, investor. Join me as I talk with global influencers for their insight, wisdom, and how they overcame their own personal challenges. Sharing positivity, overcoming challenges, creating one world together. I'm Patrick Sang, anything is possible. Welcome everyone to another episode of Anything is Possible. We have a special guest, Asso Attar. She's now the CEO of Lead Associates, a company that does fashion, e-commerce, a lot of uh, luxury business. Um, Asil is a great entrepreneur, business lady. She's been voted on Forbes, uh, one of the 30 most influential people in, in the Arab world. She's also been named in Forbes Middle East as the top 50 CEOs and many other accolades. Um, we're going to go uh, deep uh, dive deep into um, some of her experiences and some of her entrepreneurial journey. Asil, welcome to the show. Patrick, great to be here. Very inspiring. Yeah. Thank you, Asil. Thank you for um, joining us. Um, it's taken us a while to <laughs> yeah. get, the, uh, get the interview together, but uh, finally we're here. Um, we're actually in the same place in London right now, but um, obviously because of COVID, it's the, cold, the weather's cold. We have to wait until the restaurants open again before we see each other yeah. uh, face. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope that happens soon, right? May 17th. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I think it will happen. I think the UK has done a magnificent job in the, they really have. the last few months. So tell us a bit about your COVID experience since, uh, you know, last year. Wow. I mean, where do you begin, right? I don't think an hour is long enough, Patrick. <laughs> I mean, clearly I share a lot of sentiment, like I'm sure all of your listeners and yourself, you know, COVID has been just an emotional roller coaster. really is what you can say. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible for me, I guess the biggest thing is to see that the entire world is at one. And this is something that certainly in my generation, in my lifetime, I've never experienced. You know, when this impact is affecting every single individual on this planet, it, it really is such a profound thought. And so, you know, of course, like many people, it's, you know, it's, it's had a lot of ups and downs, like I said. And, and I think if we look at the positive impact that it has had, I've never seen so many people with their families. I've never seen so many people, you know, taking mental health, uh, physical health, you know, spending time at home, I guess, making up certainly for someone like me and a lot of the entrepreneurs or business people out there who never really get that home and time with their family. That's That's been a, a wonderful part. And, and on another side, to see that camaraderie between people, right? To see great movements happen. I mean, historical movements are going on. You know, when we look at, uh, you know, Black Lives Matters that has come out of this, you know, how po the power of social media has actually been used for good um, is something that's been a, a remarkable change. And I, and I think from a business perspective, I've never seen so many creative thinkers, innovators, and you know, that sort of space being filled again and, and people, of course, because, you know, a lot of people were furloughed, so many people have lost their job. And so it is this time that we see innovation come, come to life and so many entrepreneurs, so many startups. And so, you know, I, I don't want to spend my time with you talking about, obviously, the, the distressing part of it, because that has been hugely difficult um, for many people, including myself, and, and a big part of it is on the mental side as well. Um, but when you look at the, all the positive outcomes, then there are some, you know, great things that we can celebrate. Talking of which, um, what kind of advice? Okay, it's a, it's a pessimistic situation. It's not good. Um, from, you know, the show, we're trying to share positivity. What kind of advice would you give to young people during this difficult time? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, support, right? I mean, surround yourself certainly by people that are very positive and are supportive. Uh, definitely, I think, uh, certainly for me, what works is I'm very passionate about coaching and mentoring and have done so for in my entire career. So the last year, actually, I have spent a significant time mentoring, you know, graduates, MBA students, uh, you know, they've been working with me on my businesses, 
uh, and taking them through that experience. I think this is a great time, not just for the young people, for a lot of older people that, you know, gaining knowledge, using this time to sort of arm yourself, you know, with knowledge, find a fantastic mentor, because trust me, there are a lot of great people out there that now do not have a job and they're very happy to sort of share their advice. So right now it's about absorbing like a sponge, you know, reaching out to people that are going to be available to you, um, you know, so get a support system, take this time to, like I said, sort of strengthen your knowledge, you know, take vocational learning, just it's about mentorship, interning, uh, because trust me, especially in interns, you see a lot of businesses are moving towards, you know, because they furloughed it, actually, they're going towards internship programs. So, you know, find that amazing opportunity, stick with it, learn with it and surround yourself. Uh, you've got to keep mentally active, you know, Patrick, volunteer in the community. Goodness knows everybody needs that. So you've got to fill your time. And that message goes out, you know, don't sit there scrolling on social media, right? Don't sit there addicted to your phone. Um, get out there mentally and participate and take this opportunity to really strengthen your foundation so that, when, you know, when there is that opportunity, you get to shine. And that's my advice to everyone out there. Great advice, Asil. So the takeaway to everyone out there is find a mentor, find good people, positive people around you and to yeah. make the most of your time. Now, I would say something like this, Asil, is that, you know, for people who, who don't have as much to do is basically to make use of the time. For people like us who are too busy, COVID has actually been a blessing for myself where I've actually tried to take time off and try yeah. not to be busy. And that actually has helped me to reset and think yes. things, through, you know, think things through, think things a little bit differently. And that's helped me as well to, to, of course. to grow as a person. So it really depends on at what stage of life you're at. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, and I guess when you're young, you know, you've got that energy, right? So I guess the message is to, to make use of it. And absolutely for so many people, including myself, you, you do have a moment to sort of that refocus, that re-strategize, reprioritize, you know, has been a huge part of it as well. But I think also you've got to surround yourself by people who support you. It's so important right now, you know, to have just that release, I think is is incredibly important for, for everybody. Of course. So Thank you very much for joining us because um, I think you're going to provide us with a lot of invaluable insight and wisdom into your journey, how you, you know, turned into a successful entrepreneur. So let's step back uh, a little bit. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about your childhood? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm originally from the Middle East. I'm, I'm half Iraqi and I also am half Indian. So I grew up with, uh, you know, I'm very blessed with beautiful parents may they rest in peace huge inspiration in my life and you know we we spent my father was a pioneer for solar energy and so you know living with an individual who in the 70s had the insight and strategic mind to understand the power of you know the environment the importance of nature um, was incredibly impactful for myself and my siblings. And then, you know, of course, with my mother, who was a very empowered woman. Look, my father came from very humble background um, in Iraq, you know, and, I, and, and actually what drove him to solar energy was the fact that he would sit and study off candlelight. You know, they didn't have electricity. And so he got a scholarship to the American University uh, in Beirut. And then after a year, got a scholarship to uh, University of Southern California, so, um, you know, incredibly inspirational um, and then did his PhD in solar energy. So watching my father go from a very humble background and and growing up with that, seeing his ambitious, but then huge amount of humility was something that grounded us. And my mother, you know, went to the States when she was 16 years old. And I'm talking she came from a very small town, you know, in, in Iraq. And so they did some incredible things in the 50s, you know, it was, it was not heard. And, and they both, you know, mom went to University of California. And so these are two kids, you know, straight from the little town in Iraq who went across the world and really made a life. And my mother was always working, you know, raising four kids, very empowered, very strong. Um, but the most important thing for me, Patrick, growing up in that, you know, my parents were incredibly ill and I don't actually ever remember them being well. So, 
um, during my my youth, you know, uh, my my siblings were lucky enough to experience them at their peak. But even through their most challenging, and they spent around 25 to 30 years of their life, they became ill very, very young. And so growing up, but still seeing that ambition to the last day and that resilience and that passion to, you know, uh, give and be relentless in their, you know, charitable work and, and being surrounded with that was very humbling, you know, so they taught us a huge amount. And so that was really very much my childhood and by those values and ethics is what I live by every single day. So, yeah. Very inspiring, um, Azil. And also for me, it's, um, I share some of, you know, their principles and ethics whereby, you know, I, I have a, a saying that I say, you know, learn as if it is your first day, live as if it is your last day. Last, where, yeah. You know, it's up until the last breath that you have, you just have to give it your all, do the best and you have to do yep. it with good intention. So it's a very, um, you're very lucky and fortunate to have parents like that. So very Absolutely. happy. Um, Absolutely. Very, um, very sorry to hear that they had a, you know, physically difficult time in terms of physical well-being. That's uh, also nothing uh, good there. And as we were talking off, I think health is the most important. That's why we have. So, so we, we share some common um, experiences from what you just said. Um, you know, I also ex experienced a lot of like racial prejudice when I was growing up in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, at Me the too. time, you know, at the time it was difficult. Um, but you know, looking back now, you know, I think that's actually a blessing because yeah. with that kind of experience, that kind of hardship, that kind of um, feeling you get from this kind of like you know name calling or whatever it was, um, that makes you grow. Um, and then looking back, is without these people, you wouldn't have become as strong as you are today. So I'm actually internally yeah. grateful some of these uh ignorant people um but um in terms of like uh you know you graduated from school relatively early and you went quite early on to entrepreneurship can you tell us um why yeah you sure i mean i early? guess you know i i get that ambition clearly from my mother and father right and the pace so and, and i'm incredibly impatient so at 15 is when i i, I went to an american uh school here in in, in london and so I recognize that they had a credit system. And so the more credit you earn, you know, the quicker you can leave. And all of my friends used to be at least three, four, five years older than me. And so, you know, I worked incredibly hard, did summer schools, did my IB because I wanted to graduate and start university desperately. So I graduated high school at 15 and then boom, I was in university. So really young and everybody was much older than me. And then, you know, I, I started doing my degree and then I realized, hey, I'm in an American university. I could do the same again because a lot of my friends graduated and went on to work and I was still, you know, doing a four, four year degree. Um, so then I did the same thing all over again and worked double time and studied really hard and did more summer school and graduated university at 19. And then you know, yeah, I attempted and, and, and failed and attempted again and again and again to start, you know, my own business. I graduated in, in interior design and architectural design. So, you know, in, in a creative field. And, and so for me, you know, I set up my own business and uh, at a very young age and was really ambitious and wanted to do my own thing and, and set out there and learned very quickly. It was not very easy to do your own thing, right? Uh, especially way back then, I'm talking many, many years ago, you know, and then if, if through that learning, I, I sort of went back and forth. And of course, I, I had my kids and, and, I, and I sort of got married, but setting up my own business back then at a very young age was highly ambitious and, and uh, you know, really difficult. They don't teach you that at school. You know, every, every kid graduates and they think, I've got all the tools, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to do my thing. And then you realize, that's not how it works. You know, I, I didn't have experience. I didn't have knowledge. You know, I had theory. So then I decided uh, I, I need to kind of arm myself. This is ridiculous. Even though I was working incredibly hard and doing quite well and met so many people in the industry because I was sort of a go-getter. You know, I was young and, and sort of fearless and I'd knock on everybody's doors. And, you know, I represented some brands from Italy and I was their sort of uh, UK rep and I'd 
it was hard, <laughs> really, really, really hard. But during my slogging and going around with my suitcases and trying to, you know, sell my products, whatever, I, I managed to connect in a very small industry. Like back in the 90s, everything was sort of, I guess the world life word lifestyle was being coined. So I was working because I was an in interior design, working with brands like Catherine Memmi and uh, Sanderson Group, you know, and all these boutique hotels and the Hempel. So I was in a really cool space in my field. And then suddenly my field became even cooler because it started merging with fashion. Um, Armani Casa, you know, was being developed. So suddenly we were sort of hanging with the with the same crowd in terms of the creative scene and touching with a, a lot of creatives within interiors within fashion and sort of then that that's how it sort of maneuvered me into I guess the fashion space. And then I think you mentioned that uh, in your role you want to make a, a difference so that you leave a legacy which also creates a social impact. Can you elaborate elaborate a bit more on your journey in order to achieve that? Sure. I mean, you know, from a career, of course, I've I've had a very um, dynamic uh, career, you know, and I guess from retail or brand or in the fashion industry, I've sort of experienced every single dimension of that field over 28 years. And through that journey, you know, there's been sort of I've never kind of belonged to the world of fashion. I've never allowed myself to be in, in sort of engrossed within that space because there's a lot of things that the fashion that I do not agree with, which then as a consequence had led to a lot of my desire to leave legacy. And that's in a number of ways, Patrick, you know, for, for 15 years now or more, you know, I've championed because of my father, of course, and his influence and my belief, you know, social responsibility, you know, um, environmental responsibility, community responsibility. So in every single business that I have led and have been involved in, I'm very proud to have structured the CSR programs, you know, supported charities, done huge, huge, uh, made huge difference to the lives of the people that I had employed and their families, as well as organizations within the community. So that's one thing, you know, in terms of impact. And of course, from the fashion business, and it, it's, I'm, I'm, I smile because today suddenly everybody's talking about social responsibility, ethical sourcing. Now, I mean, I've been talking about this for 20 years and nobody ever wanted to listen. They're like, yeah, 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 whatever, you know, we're about, you know, making money fast fashion, but you know, th this has been an ongoing issue. The great news is people suddenly are talking about it. And so that's something that's been very true to my heart. And I've worked a lot over the years on artisan preservation and continue to do so, supporting cultures, supporting craft, you know, um, so many movements that I've been involved in, especially because I've worked with India, for example, for over 20 years. So I do a lot in terms of ensuring that they have, you know, ethical practices and all the due diligence when it comes to manufacturing. And then on a personal level, you know, leaving a legacy means, and I have done, my legacy started, you know, 15 years ago when I realized I had a lot of information and knowledge. And so, like I said earlier, coaching and mentoring has been a huge part of my ability to enable others and make that difference. And so, I started that legacy, you know, 15 years ago with a great focus. And today I've mentored, you know, hundreds of designers, entrepreneurs, startups. I continually give my knowledge and share my experience very similar to you. And so, you know, these are the three areas, right? Environmental, personal, and then of course, you know, well-being. And, and that, and that's, I, I feel like, a huge responsibility, you know, to to share as much of that as I possibly can. Um, so that's what it means to me. Uh, so that's very inspirational. Thank you for that. I think uh, I would like to, on behalf of everyone, to thank you for your generosity to, to spread wisdom and your knowledge. Thank I you. Think, I think we should uh, have more people like yourself. Um, unfortunately, thank you. a lot of... Um, you know, selfishness and self-centeredness of a lot of us in human nature where we want to keep everything within. But, you know, I always say this, that, you know, we're born with nothing, we, we leave with nothing. Why don't we Absolutely. try to share more and, you know, the world will be better. So um, imposter syndrome, um, have you ever felt it? And if so, how have you tried to overcome this? 
You know, I I think, Patrick, uh, of course, especially in the earlier part of my career, you know, because I'm I was I'm very ambitious and and, you know, eager to learn. So I'm certain that in in the few roles that I've had, you know, as I was going into to mid management. Right. um, I definitely my ambition and my energy would have gotten me the job, but then implementing the job is something very different. And so you're sitting at your desk and you're thinking, oh my God, you know, I nailed it. I did it. And, you know, and you, you work, you, you fight so hard for it. And, and of course you're seeing, you know, all the other people in the room that are also going for that job. So when you nail it, you feel pretty good about yourself. But then when you're, you know, you're sitting at that desk and you're going to have to deliver it, then you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what have I done? Do I, I don't even have the knowledge. I don't even know. And so for me, definitely in the beginning, and then, you know, you quickly pull it together and you think, what are you talking about? You know, you, you, you're blessed with a mind, you know, you have intelligence, you, you're, you're armed with common sense and logic, read. So, you know, in a lot of my earlier roles, I would be implementing my day to day and I would be reading. And this was, you know, when Google had very little information and it was all going to the library and reading books. And I would spend my afternoons and evenings, you know, just reading, reading, reading about as much of, you know, the role as possible. And then, you know, and then getting on with the job, but then also spending time really looking. I'd sit in meetings and I'd say in the beginning, very little, believe it or not, because I would sit and absorb, you know, how are people interacting? If asked the question, how do my, you know, seniors respond to this? So I was very mindful, you know, of, of learning as much as I could by my peers and, and of course my leadership. So, you know, and then slowly, slowly over the years, you know, your confidence of course grows. And then, you know, you realized it's, it's so interesting. My husband's always saying, you, you don't know what you don't know. And so, of course, you know, as a kid, you're like, I know it all. And then you realize, no, you don't. And then every job you you figure it out and every job you think, actually, I, I do know it. I'm, I'm getting to know it. But, you know, I mean, you, you're never in a position, certainly for me, where you ever reach a point where you think, I know it all. I'm done. I've never been like that. You know, every role I ever take is a new experience. And so you don't come in guns a blazing. Right. And, and, and changing the world. You come in with that you know, respect for the environment you're in and learning, you, you've got to, you've got to arm yourself with knowledge and intelligence of the role before you can sort of affect change. And so, yeah, so over the years, the confidence grows, you know, but, um, but ultimately in the early career, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty daunting. <laughs> yeah, I think the takeaway from that, um, um, Asil, is that from my perspective is that, you know, I, I completely agree with your approach to life, which is you never stop learning. And if we're humble enough to be students of life, then yes. we'll keep improving until the last minute. Um, you were one of the first, you're not one of the, you were the first female CEO of Fine Jewelers Family. How do we get more um, women into powers of influence? My gosh. That is a million billion dollar question, right? I mean, look, how do we do it is we keep on trucking, like they say, you know, I was, of course, incredibly proud. I've actually been, you know, I've had three uh, female first and three of my prior roles. They were, you know, the first female CEO in each of the groups that I was in. Um, And I'm very, very, you know, honored and really proud to have I guess, championed and led that way, right? Led the example for other women. Um, And I'm very mindful that when I'm in those businesses, just by natural default, I always end up with this beautiful 50-50 mix of men and women, you know, and... And so, you know, I earned my my roles through merit and hard work, right? And a lot of it, a lot of hard work, a lot of setbacks, so many challenges. I cannot tell you the times and, in so many different moments when I've been, you know, bullied and humiliated and talked down to, and goodness knows what have you, Patrick, as a female, even in a leadership role. And, you know, at the back of my mind, I never allow anybody to make me feel like that. You know, nobody has the right to make you feel less competent and inadequate. So for me, you know, I make sure that I'm an empowered woman and and I empower women all the time, you know, and encourage them. 
<clears throat> and the industry still has a long, long way to go. When you look at the top, you know, Fortune 500 have whatever, 8% of CEOs, that, that's just not acceptable. And when you're looking at a global, whatever, 12, 15%, this is, this is something that, you know, it's a mindset change. The, the industry and the corporates are so, so, um, I mean, my goodness, so aged in their thinking that unless you break that mindset uh, and, and then change it from the leadership, because that's where it comes down from. If leadership understand it and they're not filling a quota, that's where you make change because they need to recognize that women bring a very different perspective, you know, empathy, multitasking, just a different view and management style. And, and, you know, you're a great example because I was reading that 60% of your workforce is women. Clearly I just spoke to two of them right now. So, you know, that it's, it's examples like yourself and other businesses that need to really champion that. And that's what I'd love to see. So I'm an, I'm, you know, very proud ambassador of women empowerment, but I'm also an ambassador of empowerment generally, right? But, you know, for me, I always tell women, especially when I do female conferences like Women Empowerment, I hate it when the room is just women and there's no men. So I always, my husband's always there, my good friends. And, you know, life is a balance. And so I never, in a conference, I'm always the odd one out because I'm not the one moaning about men. I, I work amazingly with men. I'm always the one telling women, stop stop moaning about it, get on and do it. It's hard. Absolutely. It was hard for me, you know, but if you don't keep on trucking and you keep, and you keep knocking those doors, um, you know, it, you're not going to pave the way. And it's great because at least we see it multiply and it is, you know, some great movements in that shift, but there's a lot of work these groups need to do certainly to, to enable this more. So thank you for uh, reading up on some of our, what we do. Um, I just, I've, I've said this many times already, which is, um, you know, I'm all for empowerment. And to be honest, I'm not a big proponent of female empowerment. I think men and women are not equal, but it doesn't mean men and women should not be equal to the same opportunity. Right. We, didn't, we didn't set out to employ more women than men. We just, mm -hmm. we were very fair that we found yeah. the right, people for the right exactly. job exactly. and I keep saying this that you know I, I find it very insulting actually to women when we say oh she's the first female CEO <laughs> what do you think she's the female founder it's like I don't care if it's a female founder it should be just the yeah. founder or whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. Right? you don't say he's he's the 10th male CEO <laughs> exactly so the fact yeah. that we say the first female is not good, but you know, the, the, unfortunately, the environment, both on Wall Street and the corporate world, it's still very male dominated. We've seen some progress, but there's still a oh. long way to go. Um, I believe 100% on what you said in terms of balance. You know, I'm very proud of my Asian roots. And in Chinese culture, it's all about yin and yang, which is the energy. Without male, there's female. Without female, there's no male. So we need both. And I yeah. think that you know, once we have more females and males together, giving their views, because, you know, if you use Instagram, if you use retail, if you do whatever thing that you may be doing, mm -hmm. there are 90% men and 10% women. It's almost an equal 50-50. So it means yeah. that people buying fruit, people buying cars, people buying this, it's a 50-50 joint decision between couples, between families. And you need to understand what, the females want not just what the men want even though a lot of men are in like the dominant position so yeah uh, we have to work together and I, I i'm very um thankful and admire your um honesty to say that it's not a competition between men and women we have mm -hmm. to work always until there's no more humans right right so right I, I think it's a change in paradigm shift in terms of not just men but even women shouldn't think that men are the enemy because they're not yeah and, and therein lies the problem i think that's the thing patrick and and if you if you don't break that barrier of communication or you're, you're not going to really move ahead and then and like you said you know you're still there is still that question of corporate you know an aged mindset where you know men do dominate and that's that's the reality and those are the stats and that's what we see and and that is a it's going to be a long time that's going to it's a process 
change that. Trust me, I've been there and it is a process. It is a process, but you know, we got to keep on trying. That's it. Sure. And, then, and, and we will like women can vote now, you know, black people are not stopped from going on the bus now. So there is progress, but you know, there's a lot more that we can do. Moving yeah. on regarding entrepreneurship. What do you yeah. think is top quality um, that an entrepreneur needs to possess to be successful? A whole bunch of resilience. <laughs> yeah, you've got to be thick skinned and ready to be knocked down at least a million times, you know, before you can get up again. You know, you've got to be armed with a whole bunch of passion. Of course, you've got to love what you do. And 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 again, you know, my, my whole thing about surrounding yourself with the people that will drive you and give you the knowledge and give you that mentorship to hopefully, you know, lead you to the right way because entrepreneurs you know are creative thinkers and they're thinking in a whole bunch of different spaces and you need to have I guess that logic or that guidance with you um, you know and and that's very difficult when I work with entrepreneurs it is very you've got to be open to critiquing the worst thing you know I, I have created so many investment decks and heard so many pitches and because you're the founder because you're the entrepreneur you're you, you know you drank the Kool-Aid you believe in yourself a million percent and that's fantastic but then when you sit down and you're critiquing you know whether it's a, it's a vision a, a plan whatever it is and you see their faces go you know and, and, and they're very sensitive to that. And that's one thing that I spend a lot of time with, especially if it's a startup, by saying you've got to get constructive criticism. You have to listen. I think that's the other thing that entrepreneurs are not great at listening. Uh, you know, they're, they're great at doing, they have the ambition, they have the energy, you've got a whole bunch of energy, but you must listen um, and take the advice so that you're successful. Because how many startups and entrepreneurs, you know, do you see that are not that successful? So, you know, so resilience, passion, listening and surround yourself by a mentor or create a board from day one, you know, of people that will really guide you and, and then listen to it, take it, accept it and act on it. Otherwise, if you're not, then, you know, that that's where the trouble starts. Great advice, um, Asil. I mean, from my own um, perspective is that um, listening is such an underrated um, quality that people don't do enough of. Um, God gave us two ears, and only yeah. one. so we should be doing more more listening than speaking. But unfortunately, in this loud uh, modern era, people like to talk more than they listen. They sure do, Patrick. They sure do. Trust me. You know, if people listened just just twice as much as they listen now, and and that's already a low base. Um, probably, you know, the world would not be in, in the state that we, you know, unfortunately find ourselves in, in many different circumstances. But yeah, listening is one of the most, I guess, challenging skill sets to even for myself, you know, it's taken me years, years with maturity and wisdom to understand the power of listening and what it really can, uh, you know, what you can achieve if you do that. So yeah, those are those are my key, key wisdom and knowledge for entrepreneurs. Absolutely. So every CEO, every leader, everyone has their own style. I read on your website that you say, I don't compete, I succeed, and I lead with a focused strategy. Can you elaborate, elaborate a bit more on that? Yes. I mean, for me, first of all, I mean, my leadership style is one that is trans human. First and foremost, it's human. And then it's followed by, you know, I am definitely a, a transformational and social leader, which means that I'm very, very involved, you know, with, with the whole energy and, and sort of business. And, and I, I lead with the ability to or the objective to create impact. Right. So when I take on, you know, the roles that I have, whether they're turnaround or restructure, you know, big roles and clean up is what I do and, and, and sort of refocus businesses and. And my main objective is focus and my strategy is about making impact and difference. So I, you know, my focus is making positive impact to the people and then the profits. And, and that for me is that order, not profits and people, people. And then because without the people, 
I'm not going to get you the profits. And it's really interesting because, you know, in so many interviews that I've had, they say, well, well, how do you do, you know, how do you turn around a business and make 300% profit in 18 months or whatever, you know, these exponential, um, you know, uh, deliverables uh, that I've had and believe it or not through people, um, you know, that's, that's sort of, um, that's how I drive transformation. So when I say I don't compete, I don't sort of spend my time engaged in the competition. I, I'm busy getting the job done. You know, you, you sort of you're mindful and you're in tune with the competitive landscape. But I have a job and my job is to lead. You know, as a leader, I'm always even coaching my previous chairmen, you know, saying when, when we, we have to have a leading he- mindset, which means don't get stuck in the now, you know, think innovation, think creative, think strategic. So and, and so that's what keeps me focused. I go in, I'm, I know I've got a job, I deliver it. And if my my teams are, if that mindset has shifted and my teams understand that, you know, the more we make as a business, because I always link social responsibility to any business that I have. So they recognize the more we earn, the more we give. And so that has been a huge driver because they can see it. You know, if we achieve, then I'm going to you know, support charities and, you know, you're going to be able to support your family. So it's this this whole, you know, transformation of a business. And that's what I say. I lead with a focused strategy because my end goal is to impact people and profit. So that's it. Very inspiring, Asil. Asil, you're also a fellow podcaster. Your podcast is Turban Thinker. Tell us about the podcast and what's the mission of the podcast? Um, yeah, I mean, so I started Turban Thinker really, you know, like many people, it, it started the lockdown. And I, I guess it's a cu- culmination of a number of things. First and foremost, it's my legacy again. It's my ability to bring so many like minded people and share their experiences on a platform and sort of, you know, enable and motivate and support others. So, you know, I built that and I and I've been very, very very, you know, lucky to have some fantastic people like yourself be on the podcast, sharing their stories, sharing their journeys, talking about their successes and and a lot about their, you know, failures and and what they learned from that. And for me, I did it with a single focus of, I, I desperately want to bridge the gap between, you know, Gen Z and the millennial with my generation, you know, and try to explain to them that I get you and you need to get us. And you know, whilst you may be incredible in your space, you know, we have 28, 30, however many years knowledge that we also can give you. So it's kind of bridging the two. So I talk to a lot of startups, young designers, um, you know, and it's a space where literally they, they can come and talk about their journey and, and hopefully we inspire and motivate and empower others that are listening. That's great. I've been listening to, to some already and it's very good to see some like young people telling us their views and their insight and it's always good even from you know people older to 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 think or get a feeling of what the younger people are thinking that's your right yeah that's very important exactly so, something a bit more fun um sure. can you can you share with us um a book or movie that you've read that ha- has inspired with inspired you that you would share with the audience well believe it or not even though the other day I read some, I don't know, some sort of sponsored ad that said that, you know, great leaders and amazing CEOs read around 60 books a year. Well, let me tell you guys listening, I I think the last time I read something was probably when I was around, I don't know, 15, I'd say, you know, in honesty, seriously. So I, I haven't read good to great. I haven't read all these incredible books of how to be a leader. I've just got on and done the job. So you know, in terms of the greatest books I've ever read, last really cool one was Huckleberry Finn, you know, Mark Twain. But joking aside, I think, Patrick, for me, uh, of course, I'm reading all the time. You know, you you can't but not read constantly. I mean, it's available on your phone and you're absorbing information. But, you know, joking aside, for me, what I read in and out and what I have read for the last two or three decades of my life is is the Quran right? For me, you know, my holy book and my Quran is what I read. And that is my saving grace. And that is what gives me my serenity and my calm and my ability to focus and to prioritize. And so, you know, I I have a very clear ritual, even when I join businesses, I'm very honest, and I'll say, I'll never start work until about 1030. You know, don't ever expect me in the office sooner 
for a number of reasons. One is because I work really hard and late. Um, but the other reason is because I have a very, uh, a, a very regimented routine that I've had for almost 30 years. And in the morning I get up and I pray, I read the Quran, you know, and I, and I do that for about two hours. Right. So it's very important for me and nothing compromises that. So that is the book that I read every single day. And the greatest, you know, if you ask me about the greatest movie for me is equally the message, right? Because, you know, the message is, of course, by one of the most amazing producers, Mustafa Al-Aqad, uh, who is a very dear friend from my father as well. But, you know, the message, of course, is a de depiction of um, our prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam. So in his journey and Wow, what a journey. So, you know, going through what he did and his experiences, you know, so this is really, you know, my faith is incredibly important to me, uh, Patrick. And that's something I know that you've asked me, you know, in the questions and you, you'll, you'll ask. But so that's the book that I read and that's the movie that I love, you know. And of course, I, I see other movies, et cetera. But if you're asking the ones that inspire me and have done, that keep me sane, uh, in this world and you know we all need our sanity is uh, those are the two that have truly you know impacted my life and so that's very interesting because it's um it also shows you you know we all have different faiths religions cultures but one thing that's very common to us is that things like discipline like getting up in the morning making sure that you stick to your routine whether it's praying meditating yeah eating yes. correct whatever it may be and if you're able to maintain that over quite a you know substantial period of time it gets you into a very strong mindset to be very focused to do what you have to do post yeah. your daily routine so i i um, totally admire and congratulate on you uh for that because a lot of people are not able to do so um speaking of which in, in inspiration who's your role model you know, I, so if you're talking about from a personal perspective, then, of course, you know, my, my mom and dad, I think they were hugely and they continue to be every single day. You know, the greatest examples that have impacted me in, in my life and taught me everything, everything, uh, you know, that I know today is truly because of them. And then from a business, you know, I think I've never had a mentor. And funnily enough, in a recent interview, somebody asked me that. And I just, as much as I am passionate and I mentor, I never actually in my career ever had a mentor. And so the people that inspired me are those that were the most, you know, positively disruptive uh, business owners. And of course, Mohammed al Fayed would be the most, you know, he, he was a great influence on me in my earlier part of my career. You know, he, he got a lot of uh, slack and he was always in a very difficult predicament in his personal life. But, um, you know, Harrods, I, I chose when I got into retail to join Harrods. That was a very strategic decision because I wanted to be trained by the best, work for the best, experience the best and become part of an institution. And, and you know, Harrods back then certainly is a school of thought. And you know, the entire hiring process to the, you know, you don't even touch the shop floor. You've got to be two weeks in the training rooms, understanding brand experience, becoming a Herodian, you know, talking a certain way, standing, they teach you etiquette. There's a whole two week, and that's just for the salesperson because I started out on the shop floor and I went back to Harrods a number of times. And so they invest all of that as a sales associate. So, and I understood that. So, you know, one thing that I remember when I was a salesperson is that every day, like clockwork, this remarkable man, okay, would tour Harrods four times or five, five floors and, and, and remember the names of almost 3,000 people. He would stop without, you know, without fail and speak to everybody, you know, every salesperson, every employee during his incredible round, which took about four hours. So he, he was literally touring all day when he was in town and then stop and talk to his, you know, customers. And I'd watch him, you know, he'd have candies in his pocket, give them to the kids, speak to his customers. And we, we, used, we used to see customers going and saying, I haven't had my delivery from my five seater sofa. <laughs> 
<laughs> talking to the chairman of, you know, this retail magical space. And he would stand there and listen and make it happen, you know. So his relationship with his teams and his customers was hugely impactful. And then coupled with the magic of Harrods, I mean, he was a, you know, he was all about the theater, you know, bigger, better, best, you know, when you see the Batmobile, when, you know, when you see President Clinton, you know, hanging out in your, you know, as a buyer, when I came back to Harrods as a buyer, you know, hanging out in my, on my floor, and then, you know, the magic of these you know, the Egyptian hall and these theatrical things that he understood how to create theater, how to build a brand, how to create impact, seeing people with sleeping bags that are circling Harrods three days before for the Harrods sale and these big banners on the big red bus, you know, there's only one Harrods, These, you know, there's only one sales. So I learned marketing, I learned theater, I learned retailing. So Hamid Al-Fayed was very important for me. And then, you know, along the way, I had some, I, I call them sort of indirect mentors, and he was one. And I, I actually was very lucky to work very closely with him as well and sort of witness his his madness, you know, and his, his method of creating these big theatrical things. And then at the same time, you know, I had some not great bosses, which, which broke me. And those are the ones, it's like when you get an A, you celebrate for 10 minutes. When you get an F, you're going to cry for a good few weeks, you know, and the ones that beat me and broke me are the ones that I, you know, through time have understood that the ones that have made the biggest impact for me because I learned what not to do. So every time I didn't experience that, I'd come out and say, I'm never, God, I just, you, you've, you've, you scarred me. And therefore I will always remember this feeling and I will never allow myself to make anybody, not that I ever would, feel the way you made me feel. So, you know, those are the inspirations, right? I mean, on, on a personal mom and dad, on, on a business, the good and the bad have inspired me, frankly, Patrick. They really have. <laughs> so just to share with you, actually, um, I had a one of my first uh, bosses, this is like over 20 years ago, um, was a taskmaster. And I had a very tormented uh, year and a half. And during that time, um, I hated every minute, but because of the level of um, quality that he this demanded, it made me do it, you know, tw I worked twice as hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that has, I've actually learned from him more than anyone else as a result. <laughs> all of the pain um i uh, hear you <laughs> I, I i never want that to, re to be repeated but unfortunately the scarring of that experience has actually raised my game um which i probably wouldn't have done it if someone like you know uh encouraged me so i still what is your life ethos listen i think you know we've discussed that repeatedly today and it's about you know that that legacy right and that social impact you know i live by that every single day and so that is you know really you know be kind have humility be respectful people we are all equal on this planet and you know there's nothing more for me there's nothing more powerful than having you know, humility and, and, and dignity. I think these are the things that, you know, that, that that's all you have, right? And, and the good words that people that will say, you know, when, you, when you've left. So that's my, my you know, life plan is, is to hopefully try to make as much difference as I possibly can. Yeah. Great advice, uh, Asil. Asil, what is uh, the next big thing for you? Well, you know what? I'm not going to lie. I would very much like to be the CEO of Uniqlo. <laughs> so, Mr. <laughs> Yanai, <laughs> if you're watching me, you know, I tell you why, because I think throughout the years, you know, after 28 years, you sort of groom yourself and you get to a point where you've invested so much in your learning and it's global and you're sort of you have so much experience. And then you sit back and you think, OK, if I were ever to take on a job again, you know, of course, I'm consulting and I, and I do that. That's my main business. But I always sit there and I think and I'm asked that all the time as well. You know, what kind of role would you ever take? And I think 
I, that that's the one name that comes up the actually the only name that comes up in my mind time and again for a number of reasons remarkable man clearly remarkable brand clearly but what i love and 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 what i've read is his you know respect towards women and actually you know i i'm pretty sure in a statement he'd said um that he would like his successor to be a uh, female right and so that's very inspiring for me you know patrick when when you have wow i mean to to be to even imagine myself working our last question always on anything is possible where we share positivity overcome challenges and create one world together is always please share with us your number one advice to our audience especially our younger viewers yes well my number one advice is stay positive you've got to keep a positive because guys trust me the world is full of infinite possibilities and definitely definitely anything is possible as long as you work hard you believe in yourself that's so important and you surround yourself by those who believe in you that are my closing words patrick and i truly believe absolutely like you do with conviction that anything is possible if you put your mind body and soul into it as i said i couldn't have summarized it any better thank you very much once again for joining us and it's been absolutely uh, amazing to talk to you sorry we've run out of time but um i'm truly mean it it's been very inspiring i love the energy um i think you talk with a lot of heart um and again i also agree that you know material things don't drive people they don't motivate people it's just uh, a byproduct of good work so thank you thank you patrick so much for having me it's been a fantastic fantastic you know time with you and great learning and you know your work is inspiring really it is and i'm so glad that we met and had this opportunity because you know it it excites me when i meet individuals like you who have you know shared values and that makes the world such a better place so thank you so much pleasure thank you thank you thank you